Um, hello, everybody. Um, I just want to start by thanking Morris for this fantastic um, opportunity. Um, some people might see, might believe that this is small in a hotel in Dublin. Uh, I think this is an absolute magnificent opportunity um, on an international level as well with the scale of the conference. So I just want to thank you, Morris, just to start out. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I haven't used one of these before, so just bear with me. Um, so yeah, so my name is uh, Shane Griffin. Um, I'm a care leaver. Uh, I'm now the advocacy manager with Care Leavers Network Ireland. Um, and that's a network that some people might or might not be familiar about. Uh, but, uh, but I hope by the end of the presentation, uh, people are more familiar with the network and with myself and also some other care leavers. Um, yeah, so that's just our logo on our website. So it's careleaversnetwork.com. And we can come back to that um, and even during lunch and this afternoon. Um, so a bit of an introduction about myself. Um, you might notice my presentation might be um, slightly different. Um, so like I'm a father, I'm a boyfriend, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm an uncle, I'm a friend. I'm just like everyone else. Um, you know, the, and, and why I've you know, used that to start was that, you know, to break some of the stigma attached to being a care leaver. You know, that we're all these other special things and all these other meaningful things. Um, and so that's why I wanted to just start with that. So I just happened to be a care leaver as well. I spent eight years in, in foster and residential care. Uh, I just happened to be a social studies graduate also. Um, I've worked with young people and adults in residential care. Uh, I've worked as a volunteer and continue to do so um, with various marginalised and disadvantaged groups. It's something that I hold a strong passion for. Um, I'm the advocacy manager, as I think you might know, but I'm also a volunteer with Care Leavers Network, or sorry, Care Leavers Ireland. And that's a small charity um, that I'm involved with that provide educational support to care leavers. Um, and education and care leavers, I have a strong relationship with. Um, so today I'm speaking from personal experience and attained knowledge. Um, I have <laughs> I have a slight agenda and a few boxes I have to take, um, you know, by providing this opportunity. So I'm just going to speak about you know raising some awareness of issues that care leavers face, and um, moving from care. Um, I'm going to revert to a survey that the Care Leavers Network carried out as also, um, and in the last three I'm going to speak in a very um, very loose and personal capacity as well. So that's about leaving state care unplanned, um, dependency on state agencies from childhood to adulthood, um, and then returning to family of origin. And there's going to be a very loose format as well, so I, I won't really so much focus on the PowerPoint because they will be emailed and available online, okay? Yeah, so um, some of you might notice if you've read the conference brochure um, that I, I put a, a little piece in. Um, so at a, at a young age, a large boulder was placed on my shoulders, a large boulder. And that's more of a, of a metaphor than an actual boulder, because I don't think I'd be standing here up straight if this boulder was placed on my back. Um, so I'm going to move now so into issues um, that care leavers can encounter and uh, an input um, from care leavers. Um, and although my input is included in this. It, it's more of a broad input. So these are the, the, the big, big words. Um, and over the last number of days, and over the last number of years, and decades, and lifetimes, and into the future, these big words um, will, will you know, hit home with a lot of people, and also the professionals. Um, some. Some big words that jump out to me is permanency. We're after hearing this from uh, Mandy this morning. Um, permanency is a big, big thing, and it means so much. Um, it's, it's, it's too much to get into today. Um, but aftercare as well. Um, at one o'clock today, ironically, uh, we have the committee stage of, of the aftercare legislation, something that I mean following closely and trying to you know, get out in the domain and, Maybe we could even live stream during the lunch and um, the events 
Um, but I think as practitioners, um, who are constantly frustrated, I feel frustrated as a practitioner, as a care leaver, as all these, these titles that mean so much to me. Um, but I think what we can do is we can, you know, in such a casual way, educate those we work with and how to give them a voice. And I think, you know, being, you know, like being able to vote, being registered to vote, and, and being taught about that process is, is, is a vital aspect going forward. And, and it, it takes something so small. Um, I was nearly even thinking um, yesterday to, to not attend a conference and just to stand outside the doll and speak to people coming and going and just ask the question, how, do you know what a care lever is? And just start this progressive, casual dialogue, not going up there with the agenda, only to be a presence outside. You know, and it's something I might um, go, you know, look at you know, in maybe December, January, coming up to the election and stuff. Um, but, you know, and out of that as well, you know, what would motivate me to do that is, is I have a voice and, and, it's, and it's to get that voice heard. And a lot of it might fall on deaf ears, but I'm, I'm venting, I'm, I'm getting it off my chest, as I say, you know. Another big word that jumps out in topical terms is homelessness. Homelessness has been an issue for care leavers for, for decades. It's not the topical, traditional, um, austerity felt homelessness um, and, and homelessness to care leavers is massive and if everyone in the room including myself today has a home we are absolutely privileged it's a base it, a home is so much it's a lot more than four walls and a roof this slide and the following slide it's just through dialogue and, and, and speaking to care leavers um, very recently, I've put together some small bios. Um, and I'll just touch on, on, on one from each slide. And care leaver one um, is a male key care leaver, turned 18 while living with a foster family, had sporadic contact with birth family uh, before and after uh, becoming a care leaver. Um, the education advanced from leaving Cert to university in a very, you know, natural and progressive path. Um, that care leaver is now living independently. Um, and I go on to the next one, um, care leaver three, uh, turned 18, living in residential care, built relationships with time, with extended family. Um, the education path was somewhat sporadic. Um, mine was absolutely chaotic. But I got there, you know. Um, five years of, of, of five years on attained a primary degree, and six years on after that. So we're looking at eleven years. Went from having a leave insert to, you know, that care leaver now has a master's in social work. You know, so these are very exceptional people that that move through life at all different levels. Um, this is just somewhat of a, of a summary um, of, of the four bios. Um, you can read some of them yourselves, I'll just focus on the middle one. Um, and the all report is sporadic contact with birth family, missed opportunity while in care due to sibling separation, another focus on extended family and time with maturity. You know, and this just kind of drills home to me that everyone moves at their own pace. So, and I think that creates a lot of conflict. Because when you have a system, and this system works in such a tight, and you know, it, it's not really care leaver client centered in a way, when you have a glove that's supposed to fit thousands of people. And this is somewhat of my bio. <laughs> um, it looks funny on one slide, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, I left care just before my 14th birthday, own plans. I left from residential care. Uh, when I say own plans, um, from the, the very first time I entered um, foster care on a voluntary basis to the time a court order was in place was over three years. Um, and when I was in my last residential placement, it took 48 hours for me to move from aftercare and all these big titles so I find that kind of fascinating in a way that it took three years 
um, you know, t for, for state agencies to get a care order in place, um, which was, was needed, I'm not disputing that, but it took them 48 hours to decide, just like click of a finger, that I was going home and, you know, there was, there was no aftercare. So I can't speak as someone, as a recipient of aftercare. You know, I can reflect and tell you what I should have had and what I could have had, but I can't tell you that I had aftercare. Um, so yeah, my, my sibling relationship, something that I hold personally, it's a, a very strong. Um, you know, that was sporadic. And it was sporadic because the word opportunity I'm going to refer, revert to a lot, but it was a missed opportunity and an undervalued opportunity. Um, I've thankfully rega regained that now. But I know, and I speak to, and I hear care leavers that haven't got that, that have a desire for that, that have tried and have constantly beat themselves up because they cannot speak to their birth brothers and sisters. Um, and I understand that family is a lot more and means so much more than just blood to people. Um, but I, I am a traditionalist and a bit old school, and, and, and my blood... Uh, and my family means so much to me. And also, people that aren't blood, that I consider part of my wider family. Um, default mode is just a term I put on basically, you know, reverting back um, pre-care experience. So when I talk about default mode, um, I'm talking about you know, boiling back, you know, like, you know, maybe two steps forward, five steps back. Um, so. I'm going to skip on now because I'm conscious of time, but um, yeah, so day, my, <laughs> my 18th birthday, um, there was a celebration, uh, and I'm nearly sure it was eight days after my 18th birthday, and um, I was renting a room in a house, um, and it wasn't out of necessity, it, it was out of a need to survive. I'll talk about that somewhat later. I just wanted to play um, a short video, it's three minutes and 58 seconds long. And I want to play this video in such a meaningful way in, in memory of, of care leavers that are no longer with us, um, but also um, as a tribute to every care leaver. Um, thanks, Mila. Uh, I've, I've tried, and uh, apologies to the script. <laughs> in, Sorry, just while that's been sorted out. Um, the script, um, the band got together in uh, 2001. Um, and 2001, um, I left care. Um, so it, it means it's kind of personal connection as well. Um, but also I think the words will resonate with a lot of people. And uh, you know, they, you know, a lot of people that w might watch my video from today. Um, they, you know, it's very meaningful. Sorry. Maybe it's not meant to be. <laughs> so we, we, we might skip on because it's available there. I'll tell somewhat of a funny story while we're sorting this out because I think um, you know I've, I've put a lot into this um, as a dedication to care leavers um, that are no longer with us and also uh, those that are, are with us in, in, in their thousands. Um, and it, just this morning when I was getting here, uh, a lot of people were probably you know, stuck in traffic and stuff. I was panicking because I was thinking I have to get up here and I had this thing, kind of thing in my head, you know, I want to be here in time. And, I want to go for a bit of a walk and just relax the nerves and stuff. So anyway, I, I, like a lot of people, I just got stuck in traffic. Um, and I text Morris, apologies, that I was going to be late in advance. And I was, you know, gauging from the time on the trusty sat-nav. 
Um, but while I was stuck in traffic, I was reflecting, <laughs> um, which I do a lot. And I, and I was thinking, you know, it might have took me two hours to get here this morning. Um, but that was nothing, you know, in terms of what it actually took to get me here today. <laughs> and that journey was a lot longer than a, a commuter um, chaotic travel um, on, on the M4. If this fully worked out, it wouldn't be normal, I suppose, so. <laughs> Sorry now, apologies. I'm just going to revert back to the presentation. Um, the intention was, was, was toughly meant, um, so we'll skip on. And if anyone wants the, the hyperlink, and you know, the links are there and they'll be emailed around. Um, so I'll move on um, to the survey um, that we carried out. And we, we had just over 100 respondents. Um, small, somewhat a sample, but it's an absolute magnificent resource. Um, and I, I don't know, just f from, you know, surveys as such, you know, the people here might have used surveys in the research and theses and stuff, we got an absolute wealth of additional comments. Um, and it was actually a shame that I, di I didn't bring them today in a way, but it's just a wealth and a resource for us to use going forward. Um, because although I can speak and give my voice, I'm only one of thousands, you know. Um, so. So we just asked, how many years were you in care? So you can see just under 50% um, were in care for seven to 10 years, you know, greater than 10 years. So, you know, um, did you feel you had a choice in decisions about your life while you were in care? Um, you know, and I, I suppose this is interpretive in a way. Um, do you? Do you think that adults who are making decisions about your life listen to you? Um, so that's just what a hundred care leaver said. And I can understand I had a frustration as well about you know being heard and my voice being heard. Um, and this, you know, when you're working in the remit of a chaotic environment, it's very hard to even hear your own voice. Um, so I can kind of empathize to a degree um, on, the, on that. Uh, overall, do you think that decisions were made in your best interests? So that's what 100 Curly were said. And the last question that I've included today was, if adoption from long-term foster care was an option, uh, would you have wanted it? Um, so that's 40, you know. It's, I, th I think that should be an option in terms of permanency. Um, I know for me, I wouldn't have wanted um, but I know one of my siblings that would have wanted that. Um, so, it, you know, it, it differs. I suppose this is my personal story. Can I just check the time, Morris? Yeah, okay, we go. Okay, so about an hour, yeah? <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to summarise um, and I'm going to provide an opportunity for anyone here today or anyone that emails me and makes arrangements. You know, I have no problem telling my story, I have no problem answering questions or, you know, getting into progressive and positive dialogue and, you know, to turn a negative into a positive. Um, my, my personal story, um, I, I was in a residential home. Uh, it was open from high support. 
Uh, I was in that residential home for approximately eight months. Um, and two days before I was due to go back to school uh, after doing first year of secondary school. Um, you know, that in itself was fantastic. Um, but two days before I was due to go back to school, you know, after a little kind of incident and nothing major, it was just a, a bit of young lads in development. Um, there was there was question about getting the guards down and cautions and all, and I panicked. I freaked out because when I was moving from high support into this residential, um, what was being talked in the dialogue and kind of you know the next move was you know these institutions that I feared, um, they were uh, you know like the prisons, the you know this this kind of you know last resorts. But I, I, I was lucky in a way. And when I heard cards mentioned, um, I thought that this was going to be a very plausible option. So I ran away. Um, I ran away from that residential home. And when I ran away, I, I done it kind of smartly in a way. And I suppose I, I was kind of half led and half my own and survival instinct kicking in. Um, but I had, I had a family member uh, pick me up down the road so I didn't have to walk the whole way to Newbridge. Uh, from where I was, um, and that family family member kind of kidnapped me in a way, and um, put me up in a relative's house for the night. And the following morning, I walked to my guardian Malaitan's office, um, and my guardian Malaitan was an absolutely rooter. He was such a meaningful person in my life, um, and from there, at, at a forty-eight hour discussion between you know with, with me being temporarily allowed home started, um, and a decision came back after 48 hours that I was staying at home. Um, I had to, there was some conditions, uh, I had to go to a counsellor. Um, I'm nearly sure my uh, mother had to engage with a parenting programme. And all that fairly quickly dwindled away. Um, you know, that wasn't a monitor thing. Um, so that to me was, was like winning the lotto. It was like winning the Euro Millions times 10 because all, all during my eight years in care, the only place I wanted to be was at home. And I know a lot of people in care want that. Um, for some, it's, it's not possible. Um, for some, they don't realise the realities of home. Um, and I was one of them people. I didn't realise what home was until I got there and I was living there. Um, and very quickly, home turned into a negative environment for me. Um, it, it, there, was, there was issues, mental health, um, substance misuse. Um, there was a lot of issues that put me back into that survival mode um, that brought, brought to the fore my natural born and, and learnt instinct to survive. Um, and you talk about resilience. It's just a very short story on resilience. Um, when I was before I was eight years old, um, I used to leave my house unknown, unknown to my parents and my other family. I used to, you know, from my pyjamas, get dressed, sneak out, climb out um, a window, you know, walk maybe a mile and a half down to a local shop, and uh, there was these metal bins to put the papers in. I used to take a couple of each paper, um, and, I, and I, there was a cul-de-sac just beside the shop. Um, and I went and I knocked maybe at 7, 7.30 a.m., door to door, selling these papers. And I'd get a couple of pounds in my pocket, and I thought I was after winning the lot. Um, but, it, but in that, what, what I'd done was I went back home, snuck back in, got out my, pajam or got out my clothes into my pajamas, hid the money. And then on the way to school, um, walking with my sister, what, it, what, what we used to do was we used to buy sweets. Um, you know, and it wasn't that we stopped and we bought a roll, we bought sweets, you know. What kid thinks to buy a roll on the way to school or to buy a breakfast? Um, so, you know, so this, when we talk about survival, um, you know, that's, that's where I learned how to survive and how I learned how to survive. Um, it's very ingenious and entrepreneurial when you think about it today. <laughs> but, uh, but that's just a little story about survival. Um, so bringing that forward, um, I, I very quickly learned how to survive and how to work my environment that, to, to maximise my potential of survival. Um, when I mentioned a bit earlier, um, just, just before, between at the age of 17, 
I was seeking to live independently, which was disputed by, you know, um, by my mother at the time. Um, and it was put in a way that my mother would tell the landlord uh, the letter of the law that I can't sign a legal agreement until I was 18. So I couch surfed, um, you know, basically I was homeless in a way. Um, but I feel I was homeless for many years in a different way. And um, so when I hit my 18th birthday, um, you know, I nearly sure it was eight days that I went and I rented a room in a house and I was trying to hold on an apprenticeship and all these other big things. Um, you know, I was doing that out, out of necessity because home was not a safe place. It was a hard lesson I had to learn, but I learned it. Um, and I suppose, you know, I'm talking about unplanned and, you know, this, this personal story, I find it fascinating um, for two reasons. I, f I find it fascinating that no state agent uh, approached me during this time, or, you know, from the time I left to the time I turned 18. I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, and I find it fascinating on reflection because I, I would not approach any state agency. There was no trust there. Um, you know, and that was a, a missed opportunity. Um, and also, I find it fascinating because young people in the general population, and especially care leavers, have this expectation that with a birthday, you are going to become this magnificent and functional adult in society. And, and, and you guys know and you see the reality, and I felt the reality. And you know, to, to generate a piece of legislation based on a birthday is, is, is not an achievement. Um, I suppose Einstein's definition of insanity uh, springs to mind, you know, where we repeat the same process over and over again, expecting different results. So the process being you know, that we're moving from 18 on an ad hoc, you know, section 45 of the, the Child Care Act, you know, we're moving from that now to 23. And there's balloons and banners going off in one particular house in Ireland and it's not my house, um, uh, you know, that's, that's not an achievement. You know, if you set your, set your goal and set your aim here, you know, you might achieve here, but if you've set it way up here, so like, uh, let's set the, the, you know, the aftercare age to 50. We might get to 25 or 30 then, you know. Like, so yeah, that's very frustrating uh, to me uh, because I know at 23, I wasn't ready for life. I'm 29 and I'm still learning, and I'm still doing all the stuff that I could have done a decade ago. So when I speak about aftercare, and I rant a lot on Twitter and stuff, you know, I'm talking to people, um, but it's good to rant. Um, and I actually started using uh, hashtag all lowercase aftercare in, in terms of this kind of progress. So if you're on Twitter, you can link into it, you know. So I suppose I'm gonna park that for now, and I know that's very, brief summary, but you know, if you want to give me a day or maybe a week or a month of your time, <laughs> I can yeah, expand. Um, this is something I'm very strongly passionate about, is this dependency and this weaning process. Um, for me, when I was born, I was dependent on, on one care caregiver, which was my mother. And, and you know, then my family and stuff. Um, and I'm not going to throw the fancy terminologies, I'm going to just speak in a practical sense. Um, but this weaning process, um, I, am, I am weaning the nearly three decades now, you know? Um, and I, I'm standing on my own two feet now here today in front of all you. But really, in a realistic manner, I, I don't feel like I'm standing on my own two feet. I still have this dependency and I still go back to this default mode, this security, this, you know, what, what I've learned to expect, what I've learned to depend on. Um, and when I talk about my weaning journey, I, I, you know, what jumps to my, the fore of that is, is, you know, from the time I first signed on as a social welfare recipient. And that to me is, is a big thing because when I was in school, um, you know, when I was 16, 17, and 15, and all these other ages, I, I swore, I promised myself that I would never, you know, sign on to social welfare. Um, and, and why 
you know, it wasn't that I had anything against it. It was because I had this desire to be independent and to stand on my own two feet. Um, and through circumstances, um, initially it was through an accident and work, and I had no choice. I had to, through occupation, claim my stamps. I was working before it was legal to work, um, you know, through school and half day Wednesdays and Saturdays. So, I, you know, I learned a work ethic um, and, a, and a very good work ethic. And through growing a dependency on, on the system of, of, of welfare in Ireland, um, that, that was dwindled away. Uh, I became heavily dependent on social welfare. Um, and that was, to me, in a way, you know, somewhat soul destroying because I had, I had ambition and I had desire. Um, and when I entered um, the welfare system, I you know, jumped through and ran, and I still metaphorically have some of the red tape attached to me here today. But I, you know, I maximized the potential. Um, you know, and I got an honors degree out of that. Um, and I'm gonna maximize you know, my honors degree and, and further that. But the red tape I met during that, on that journey was absolutely frightening. Um, and there, there is, there is we, we do run the risk you know, when we don't have, um, you know, an adequate and fit for purpose, purpose aftercare system that is nationwide, that is, 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 you know, the norm, you know, there's so much ad hoc and sporadic kind of agreements in place. But when we don't have that, we run the risk of, of, of slowly pushing young people into that system. So we move them from one dependency system to another when we should be encouraging people to stand on their own two feet. And I know it takes time to do that. It took me 10 years and I'm still not done, you know? Um, so everyone is going to be different, but I just have a fear and a worry about this system. Um, and I, I'm an anti-system person, as, as you might have gauged, but um, I think it's just something that we can avoid. And um, we can pull back the money. And I think over half a million euro was, was, was invested in me by taxpayers in the, in the last 29 years. Over, well over half a million euro. If I had a half a million euro today, I'd do a lot of great things. But this, this expenditure, and some people might see it as waste. I don't see it as waste because I'm a product of that. But you know, that money can be spent so much earlier and so, in so much more of a meaningful way. And, you, you know, and we talk about waste. And we also hear a lot as well that we don't have the money. It's unfortunate we don't have the money. We do have the money. We do have the money. We just spend it, yeah, maybe too late, in the wrong areas. So we do have the money. And don't let anyone ever say, you know, we don't have the money, because we do have it. If I was to leave care and enter the prison system, we find the money, you know, we find the money. If I was to leave care and enter the homeless services, we find the money. So if I was to leave care and wanted to do a master's, or if I wanted to buy my own house, the money could be found. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't kind of fall under any false conception. We do find the money um, when, when, when it suits and when we want to, and maybe when it's a missed opportunity. So I'm going to move on a bit. Pebble. Um, thanks to my partner uh, for this lovely picture. Uh, but this pebble, um, for me, uh, it means a lot. Um, going back to the boulder metaphor, and I've actually brought pebbles, and I would invite everyone to take one or two, and uh, try and take two. If, if there's some left over, take three and four. And why I want people to take the pebbles today um, is because, for me, this boulder and this pebble um, that I'm offering you all an opportunity to take is such a strong metaphor with, the, you know, with a story behind it. And you can summarize that into a sentence you know, it's, it's just powerful. I, I, I think it's powerful. I don't even know how I come up with it. It's just come out one day and I wrote it down and hey, pressed over here. So um, just think of the boulder. And I, I don't have to really speak about any of, of the end negative kind of concepts from my childhood. I just capture all that in a boulder. So the pebble means a lot to me because I've taken that boulder and I've, over time, chipped away at it. Um, and I continuously do, um, you know, um, and I have that pebble now in my pocket. It's actually in my jacket, but um, <laughs> I have that pebble, and I'm going to carry that for life. And and why? 
And why I think that's such a, a kind of special sentence, although extended, is, is you know that my childhood uh, and my experiences, both, both positive and negative, um, you know, and different, they will never leave me. And to believe that they will leave me is, is insanity because um, that's something that I can stand here today and say I'm proud. I'm proud of the product I, I've became. Um, so I'm just getting a reminder about the time. So I just want to, um, you know, my, my aim uh, intentionally and unintentionally is to inspire somewhat today. So if I just read this slide and I'm nearly finished. So believe and never lose sight of your dream or dreams. Through all darkness there is light. And people say the sky's the limit and I say people go to space. You know, so don't accept things as it is. And so I want to thank you all for your time. Um, and I know the presentation was a bit loose. The slides will be available and I'll be also available. Um, and my pebbles <laughs> are on the table on the way out with a couple of cards as well. So I'll just take this opportunity once again to thank you all very much and also to thank every single caregiver um, that has inspired me to do what I do. Uh, thank you very much.